Please welcome Rodney Alcala. I'll take one. number one. It was one of the most famous dating shows ever. Looking back, it is chilling to realize that this iconic show would unknowingly feature a remorseless killer. The horror story begins. I remember wanting to jump out of the car. The so-called dating game killer is one of the country's most notorious criminals, but one most people have never heard of. He had sociopathic personality traits. He had no shame. walks up and down the streets and asks people if he could take their picture. What better place to be a sexual predator than to go to a feeding frenzy like New York? She'd been strangled with nylon stockings. It's the talk of the town. Rodney Alcala has murdered at least five women. The FBI put Rodney Alcala on the 10 most wanted list. Oh my God, will Alcala get away with it? The body count is piling up. He goes on the hunt for more victims, and there's absolutely nothing to stop him. And five, four, three, two, one. Sometimes I think Chris is probably hitchhiking. Probably looking to get away somewhere. And he just probably stopped for her. She's by herself. She could have met him at a gas station while he's filling up. Can you give me a lift? But somewhere along the lines, I think he was giving her a ride someplace. I don't think she had any indication what was about to happen to her. Chris was very trusting, so, you know, that was her downfall. My sister Christine was born Christine Ruth Thornton, um, but we always called her Chris. She was 11 years older than me. Chris was tall. She was she was five foot ten, dark hair, dark eyes, just you know, a beautiful person inside and out. In the summer of '77, Chris was just 27 years old. Chris was in San Antonio. She was pregnant at the time. Christine was a um, free spirit. Uh, she kind of went where the wind blew her. She met up with her boyfriend and, you know, had this crazy idea of going to Montana to pan for gold. And my understanding is that they were in southwest Wyoming and had an argument ensued between the two of them, and he left her pregnant and alone, and I believe that's the last time any, anybody had ever seen her. In the summer of 78, I decided to go down to San Antonio and do some investigating of my own. I actually tried to find her boyfriend, but did not have a good address for him. The San Antonio police refused to take a missing persons report on Chris because she was an adult. I believe throughout all the years that Christine was missing, I think Kathy was always looking for a way to open up that door of where she is. In 82, this uh, herder out in the middle of nowhere comes across uh, a pile of bones, obviously human remains. What they found was it was a body of a 25 to 35 year old female. Along with her bones were also uh, bones of an infant. There wasn't any identification, and so it remained cold for, for many years. And investigators never imagined that those bones would lead them to a notorious serial killer 
a man I would later be called upon to prosecute. And this photograph, discovered by police, would lead a heartbroken family to their loved one, missing for almost 40 years. Her smile shared by a tragic list of young women and girls who trusted a charming stranger, only to discover a dark secret that began back in the fall of 1968. So 68 was um, tumultuous. It was sort of flower power, free living. It was quite a era and quite a year. Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy have been assassinated. Andy Warhol is shot that year. And there have been urban uprisings throughout the 60s. Being a police officer in Los Angeles or any, anywhere in the country, for that matter, at that time, Everything was anti-war, anti-establishment. And it's commented on by some of the, you know, leading vocalists of the day. You had Barry McGuire in 1965 doing Eve of Destruction. The Eastern world, it is exploding. You had Bob Dylan, of course, doing A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. The hard rain's gonna fall. So what we're seeing is the influence of the new freedoms represented by the counterculture be appropriated by mainstream culture. And that includes daytime television. That even includes game shows like The Dating Game. The Dating Game began um, with Chuck Barris back in, uh, I believe it was 1965. He had dealings with ABC and he just came up with the idea and he, he pitched it to a couple of people. It caught on right away. The premise was the female asking questions of three bachelors who sat on the other side of a partition. She wasn't able to see them, of course, and she picked one for a date, and then she met the guy that she had picked, and they were awarded a date. Looking back, it is chilling to realize that this iconic show celebrating love and romance would unknowingly feature a remorseless killer. And from the mid-60s onward, Southern California is a mecca for anyone looking to reinvent him or herself and have a fantastic time. They're all partying at some of the hotels on the Strip, like the Chateau Marmont. Tal Shapiro was an eight-year-old little girl who lived at Chateau Marmont, which is a famous hotel in California. Her father was a music industry executive. She had a mother and a sister and a brother. And they were living there because their house had gone on fire, and they were staying there temporarily. And a car pulls up alongside of her. And it's this man who says, oh, it's okay, I'm not a stranger. I know your parents. I'm friends with your parents. And she thought, hmm, well, maybe I'll get in the car. Well, fortunately, a good citizen looks at this and says, I don't like the looks of this. Holly Shapiro was eight years old, and it was a beautiful sunny day in September. And this adorable little girl would skip to school each morning, carefree, loving, wearing her little white Mary Janes. And uh, then the horror story of Tally begins. I remember the morning was nice and warm because I wore the dress that my nanny had crocheted for me. And a car pulls up alongside of her, and the man leans out and says, hmm, I have a beautiful picture I'd like to show you. And I guess asked if I needed a ride to school, and I told him I didn't talk to strangers. And he pulled up alongside of her a little further, kept trolling her, and that's when he told me he knew my parents. And I really didn't want to get in the car, um, but I was raised to respect my elders. I got in the car, that's when he asked what time my school started, and then that's when he realized that we had plenty of time and he was gonna swing by and show me a poster. You know, I didn't know to fear people. Well, fortunately, a good citizen looks at this and says, I don't like the looks of this. And he actually follows him to his apartment. The moment I felt danger was 
when he wanted to go by his place. And I remember wanting to jump out of the car. So the Good Samaritan, he actually followed the car to a residence where the man took the little girl out of the car and walked her inside, and that didn't look right. And he calls the police. He says, you know, this is real hinky looking. I don't like it. There's this little girl. You know, I think you ought to check it out. I don't remember going up to the apartment, and I don't remember anything after that. I was driving down Sunset heading toward West Hollywood when I received a call. Uh, to go see a man about a possible kidnapping. I followed him over to the location. At that time, I thought, okay, I better call in for a backup. So I went and called in and requested a backup unit. I went to the front door and started knocking. Uh, I could hear uh, someone running around. So the man came and he opened up the curtains a little bit and peered out and said, oh, sorry, I was in the shower. I'll be right there. I see this... Uh, male uh, person on the other side no clothes not dripping with water no towel and i said oh, okay you need to open the door right now i need to come in and he said wait wait let me put my pants on and i said okay you got three seconds i probably waited five seconds and i kicked the door in to the right was a dining room to the left was a living room and straight ahead was a kitchen and here was this uh, little girl, blood all over the place, uh, clothes, shoes, and a dress thrown to one side. There was uh, coins on the floor, and she had this steel bar across her neck, which probably weighed two pounds. And there's an image that I will never forget. It's an image of this pipe used to, to, to strangle her with, essentially. You press it against her throat, and more blood than should ever be able to come out of a little eight-year-old girl next to these Mary Jane shoes on the floor of this kitchen. I looked at her. I thought she was dead. She wasn't breathing. The other officers came around. We were looking for the suspect. I went back to check on uh, Telly. And I just couldn't leave her there like that. The officer had a, had a sort of a life or death decision to make. Chase this man out the back and catch him or render life-saving aid to the little girl and save her life. And he chose, he chose the little girl. And as I went back in the kitchen, she started gagging, telling. So then that put everything into high gear. But when I was yelling, the officer that was covering the back door thought I was asking for help. So he ran to the front to help me. Uh, we later found out the suspect escaped through the back door. Tally was bleeding out, literally clinging to life. Fortunately, there was already an ambulance racing to the scene. Tally arrived in the emergency room and the doctor said there was no chance of saving her. And after she had been taken by the ambulance, they started looking around the apartment to see if there were any clues as to who the person was. I found his ID. He, we determined he was a student at UCLA in the photography department. And the name of the man who attended UCLA was Rodney Alcala. They searched that house, and there are references in reports of hundreds and hundreds of photographs of young women and boys in various stages of dress, in various stages of vulnerability, that were in Rodney Alcala's possession. We had to find this Rodney Alcala. We had to get him off the street, because if he would do that to a little eight-year-old girl, uh, there's no telling what he would do. You know, it was just by, uh, you know, sheer luck that Tally didn't die. She should have died, but she didn't. She's in a coma for 32 days. Nobody thought that she would survive, and miraculously, she pulled through. She was able to get back on her feet after several months in the hospital. My parents mentioned nothing. It was never brought up. It was never spoken about. I remember walking into my classroom, 
And everyone looking at me like I was supposed to be dead. And her parents had just had enough. They could not stay in California another minute. They moved out of the country shortly after that. Uh, they moved to uh, Mexico. Uh, the father wanted to uh, give her a better, uh, safer environment to live in. And that's where they stayed for the next many years. Rodney Oncola has gotten away. And now he's, he's fled and nobody knows where he's gone. I was a police officer with LAPD. This was one of my very first cases, actually. And it was four or five months old at that time. And he was in the wind. I went out and interviewed a number of his professors at UCLA. One of the things they told me is, you know, you got the wrong guy. You know, Rod Alcala is a super guy. He wouldn't hurt a flea. Really nice guy. Police wanted to know who is Rodney Alcala and why would this well-liked 25-year-old college student so viciously attack an eight-year-old little girl? This is San Antonio, Texas, home of the Alamo. Rodney Alcala was born Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Bucor on August 23rd, 1943, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, he had an older brother, Raul. Uh, he had an older sister, and then he had a younger sister. His family lived in Mexico for a while. The grandma passed away, and the father left the family. They ended up moving to Los Angeles area, to Monterey Park. He had everything he wanted, Ocala. You know, he went to Catholic schools. He went to, you know, private schools. Everyone who knew him said he was a kind boy, a respectful boy, and highly intelligent. Rodney Alcala had every advantage that somebody could have in life. He had a mother who loved him, which is a big deal psychologically. He had friends. He had brothers and sisters who all turned out to be very successful. His older brother was already at West Point, so this is a pretty, you know, a patriotic family. And then he joined the Army in the early 60s, and that's where the trouble really began for Rodney Alcala. So Alcala didn't fare well in the Army. He went AWOL a few times, got in some trouble. As it turns out, this bright, handsome young man with the promising future had nightmarish urges that he refused to ignore. So 1963, he gets a pass from the military. He ultimately goes to New York. While in New York, he assaults a girl. He hits her over the head with a Coke bottle. That girl was able to run away. He had sociopathic personality traits. He, he had no shame, and he didn't, you know, feel guilty about anything that he did. The military felt that he had had a nervous breakdown. That was their analysis of it. The psychiatrists at the hospital felt it was a lot more serious than that. But he was discharged honorably, and not a blemish on his record. So he ends up coming back to California, where he enrolls in the UCLA fine arts program as a photography major. So Rodney Alcala is actually attending UCLA and living less than a mile away from Chateau Marmont when he attacks Tally Shapiro in 1968 and then seems to vanish. I was pretty much convinced he'd gone to Mexico because he had relatives in Mexico. So it's been three years now since the rape of Tally Shapiro. The FBI eventually became interested in the case and put Rodney Alcala on the 10 most wanted list. So I get a phone call and it's the FBI in New Hampshire. I say, hey, we've got your guy in custody, Rodney James Alcala. It, it seemed like an open and shut case, but it was just the beginning of what would become a pattern of catch and release that would continue for more than a decade. While the FBI is on the hunt for Rodney Alcala, he's actually living on the East Coast under an assumed name, John Berger. So in 1968, John Berger walks into NYU and applies to their School of the Arts. So there he was in New York, a fugitive, now for three years. What better place to be a sexual predator than go to a feeding frenzy like New York? So New York in the early 70s is certainly from the civic standpoint rather challenged. It's Mayor Lindsay's second term. He's having a hard time delivering services to people. Snow removal, garbage, 
police feel like they're under siege. Crime is certainly up, violent crime. And it's during this crime wave in New York City that Alcala is able to fly under the radar and he strikes again. Cornelia Crilly grew up in Queens. She had two sisters and two brothers, Catholic family, very well respected in the neighborhood, had a very happy childhood. She was beautiful. She had long, beautiful Irish hair and Irish eyes, big smile, very friendly and funny. A few years after high school, uh, Cornelia met dream man, Leon Borstein, and they began dating. I was 29 or 30. She was probably 23 at the time. She wanted to become a TWA stewardess. At that time, they were known as ambassadors to the world and had a lot of prestige. And once she was accepted, she got an apartment with a couple of her stewardess friends on East 83rd Street. In fact, in the east side of Manhattan, an area becomes known as the Girl Belt because for the first time, young women are living on their own and experiencing their careers as they never had in the past. I had gotten a job in, in a Brooklyn DA's office. So in the middle of the day, I got a call from her mother saying she couldn't find her. I said, okay, when I leave, I'll go find her. I'm sure she's at the apartment. Mrs. Crilly was trying to get in touch with her daughter and she didn't answer the phone. She was living in a building where I could go into the building without a key. I, I knocked on the door and there was no response. That's when I called the cops and they came over. I was at the front door when they broke into the back window. They opened the door. They told me that she had been killed. She was down on the floor of her New York apartment. She had been strangled with nylon stockings and also had bite marks on her breast. She'd been raped and brutally murdered. We got a call from the police department that somebody still had to identify the body. So I went over to the morgue. The Crilly case, very unique because she had just moved in the apartment. She's a new girl. No one knew her. So that was a drawback to the detectives in the beginning. New York PD has this brutal crime scene and no suspects. We had almost 2,000 murders that year. It wasn't peace, love, and joy. Detectives had a lot of dead ends with this case. They, they, they had nothing, unfortunately, and the case went cold. Well, still enrolled as a student at NYU, Rodney Alcala, AKA John Berger, actually spent his summers as a counselor at an arts camp in New Hampshire. So in August of 1971, two campers take the little dirt road down to the post office, and all of a sudden it starts pouring. They run inside the post office to get cover. And they start looking around to see what is in the post office. And there's the good old FBI 10 most wanted list. They go from one to the next to the next. Each one looks more horrible than the preceding one. Look at this and they're like, hey, that's Mr. Berger. So they go back to the camp and they tell the head counselor, we saw this 10 most wanted poster of somebody who looks like our John Berger. So he said, don't say anything to anyone, and I'll go down to the post office and take a look. So he comes back, he calls the FBI, and he says, I think we have your man. So I get a phone call, and it's the FBI in New Hampshire. I say, hey, we've got your guy in custody, Rodney James Alcala. I said, you've got him in custody. Fantastic. This has been three years that Alcala has been on the lam, and that Hodel has been looking for him. So uh, on the 12th of August, 1971, I, uh, with a partner, picked him up, took him to the airport, flew him back. We got our guy, you know, he's going to prison for at least 20, 30 years. Parents didn't want Tally to testify. I said, it'd be too traumatic. So I think the big fear was, oh my God, you know, will Alcala get away with it? And what's dangerous in the case of a sociopath is they're very persuasive. In 1971, Rodney Alcala is arrested in New Hampshire and brought back to L.A. to finally face charges for the rape and attempted murder of Tally Shapiro. He was very low-key, kind of came off a bit introverted, but I could see his, his mind functioning. And that's what made this guy so dangerous. 
He was able to read people very well and stay a step or two or three ahead of them. For him, it was all a, a kind of a chess game. Rodney Alcala is charged with all the crimes against Tyler Shapiro, which included kidnapping, rape, child molestation, and torture. It turns out that because Tally and her family were in Mexico, the only charge they could put on him was a plea deal for child molestation. No brutality, no bashing, no raping, no almost killing. And they wound up giving Rodney Alcala a plea deal where he pled to what's known as an indeterminate sentence. He had one year to life in California State Prison. With an indeterminate sentence, it's sliding. It's not determined. And then the parole board has more flexibility in determining whether someone's been rehabilitated or whether they're a danger to the community. This meant that Rodney Alcala would have yearly parole reviews. And what's dangerous in the case of a sociopath is they're very persuasive and he's getting therapy in prison, and they believe that he has shown enough progress that in 34 months, the California Parole Board released Rodney Alcala back into the world. Not even three years. Good behavior, they said. Model prisoner, they said. And he was out on the streets again. The heartbreaking part about this is that they could have kept him, but in those days, that was an era where they believed so strongly in the power of therapy but when it comes to fixing psychopaths, it doesn't work. So Alcala is the luckiest man in the world. He's out on parole, and he's having the best time. He's photographing people, and he one day decides to take a ride, and he starts trolling again. True to form, two months later, Rodney Alcala is caught smoking marijuana on the cliffs of Sunset Beach in Huntington Beach with a 13-year-old girl. And he was caught by park rangers. So he gets arrested yet again. And this time, he gets two and a half years, and he's taken to prison. In June 1977, Rodney Alcala is released again from California State Prison, and he goes in, a uh, different parole officer this time, and he asks for permission to go on some vacations. And the parole officer miraculously says, sure, go ahead. So Rodney heads off to New York. July 1977 in New York was a difficult time for everyone. It was hot, it was steamy, the garbage wasn't being collected. When you used to read the newspaper, Daily News or the Post, the first 20 pages are just violence, 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 every day. There were a lot of murders going on, including Son of Sam. During the time of Son of Sam in 1977, the city was afraid. Look, you had a lunatic running around shooting men and women in cars. Police in New York are on special alert tonight for a psychopathic killer who calls himself Son of Sam. His favorite targets, young white women with long, dark hair. During that time, Alcala is taking a lot of photographs. He walks up and down the streets and asks people if he can take their picture. Young boys, older boys, young girls, older women, doesn't matter. He just wants to take photographs. And a young woman says, sure, you can take my photograph and they start talking and they get along. It's very nice. Her name is Ellen Hover. Ellen was strikingly beautiful. She had long dark hair and long slender arms and legs and carried herself like a dancer. Her father was the owner of Ciro's in Hollywood, a well-known nightclub where Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin and her other people appeared. Ellen was very trusting of other people. She came from a Hollywood family, grew up in Beverly Hills, and then Great Neck, and then Manhattan. Ellen loved people. On July 13th and 14th was the famous New York City blackout. This is an ABC News special report. New York City went totally dark last night, and tonight large parts of the city still are without power. It's lawlessness. People loot. Crime goes through the roof. You know, people are afraid. No refrigeration, no water, no lights on one of the hottest, steamiest nights of the year in New York City. It was a very unsettling, hard time for most people. On July 15th, Ellen Hover goes missing. That evening, friends tried to get in touch with Ellen. Nobody could. The phone rang. It was Ellen's mother, Yvonne Schwartz. Mrs. Schwartz asked me if I had heard from Ellen since the weekend and I said no the next thing I knew I was watching the 11 o'clock news and there was Ellen's picture New York heiress missing 
And the next day, when the police showed up at her door, they looked inside and they found on her calendar there was an entry that said she was meeting John Berger. Ellen Hover's disappearance was a huge mystery. This was a very big deal, that the socialite, this young woman, was just gone, missing. There was nothing in her background that suggested that she would have run away. It's in the New York Times. It's on posters. It's on the news. It's the talk of the town. When the police showed up at her door, they looked inside. Nothing looks like an attack happened there, but they collect evidence and mail, notes, things like that. And one of the things they take is, is her calendar. And there was an entry that said she was meeting John Berger. They research back, and they, they try to ID who John Berger is. You're talking about a woman who goes missing in New York City pre-computer. And so Rodney Alcala slash John Berger was never really on the radar of the New York City Police Department. So Alcala goes back to LA and he's there actually trying to find a job. Rodney Alcala gets a job with the Los Angeles Times working as a, as a typeset. You have to put this into perspective. On the lam for three years, 10 most wanted, two stints in jail, felony. He applies under his own name Rodney Alcala, and he gets the job. He actually would bring in photographs to show some of the people at his work. A lot of the photos were of nude girls. And I think it was like the time when people didn't really question it. You weren't like, oh my God, you're a pedophile. Like instead they were like, oh, he's just kind of strange. You know, he's very artsy. So five months after Alcala is returned to L.A., the FBI is actually able to connect the dots between Rodney Alcala, the name John Berger, and the notes found in Ellen Hover's calendar. So Rodney Alcala was eventually questioned by the FBI in relation to the disappearance of Ellen Hover, and he admitted being with her. Where did you meet Ellen on the uh, 15th? He said he had taken her up to uh, Westchester to take a picture. They had a lovely time, and that was it. Never saw her again. I think it would be called, like, dropping her off. That would be it. At that point, they still had not found a body. Other than him admitting to the crime, saying, I killed her, there wasn't enough to arrest him. This is Bill McCreary in North Tarrytown with a story about the discovery of the body of a millionaire's daughter missing for the past 11 months. Ultimately, she's found. It's almost a year later. She's found up in an area by the Rockefeller Estate. They found clothing of hers nearby. They went back to the same site, and they discovered her remains. But it's all skeletal. She's identified through dental comparison. Well, police are able to positively identify the remains of Ellen Hover, there is no forensic evidence that leads them to her killer. 1970s was considered a serial killer central. You have the Hillside Strangler, the Night Stalker, two freeway killers. You have the Bedroom Basher. Elsewhere, you have Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy killing people in Chicago. Recently, there's been a rash of mass murders. 1977 through 1978, many women were murdered. Police in this era are lacking a lot of the investigative tools they have today. There's no DNA. There's no surveillance camera around every corner. People aren't walking around with a GPS in their pocket. All of these things lead to this sort of perfect storm for Rodney Alcala, where he's able to remain one step ahead of police, and he goes on the hunt for more victims, and there's absolutely nothing to stop him. Jill Barkham was a 19-year-old girl in New York who was adventuresome and wanted to take a trip with a friend of hers. And so she left New York for Los Angeles. Jill and I were very close as children growing up. We were often mistaken as twins. Jill had a very free spirit about her. Bruce was very sad when she left New York. 
uh, was very scared for her, being so young at 19 years old. So November 10th, 1977, I called home and there was crying in the background. They said, you, can, you need to come home. You need to come home. And that's all they would say. Jill Barkham was found off of Franklin Canyon Road and it was down the street from Marlon Brando's home at the time. She was found bent over, half naked. Her head was facing the dirt. She has multiple ligatures on her neck. It was a brutal crime scene. I came into a house of, of uh, siblings distraught, righteously so, and heard it from my mother directly that my sister was dead. Her face was unrecognizable. Her brother said at the funeral that he couldn't even recognize his sister. Um, it was so mutilated. I had night terrors uh, the day that Jill's body arrived. It wasn't just murder, it wasn't just rape, it was, it was brutal, it was sadistic and nobody could understand why the things happened to her. They thought perhaps this could be the work of the Hillside Strangler because that's what the Hillside Strangler did. He strangled women and left them on the side of the road. And it complicated this investigation because Jill Barkham had a, had a friend when she got out to LA that was actually abducted and murdered by the Hillside Strangler. In the end, the police were unable to link the murder of Jill Barcombe to the Hillside Strangler, and the case just went cold. That meant the string of murders of young girls and women continued. Georgia Wickstead was 27 years old. She was absolutely gorgeous. She was a nurse that worked for cardiac care. She was from Los Angeles. She worked out of the Sentinella Hospital and just recently moved to Malibu. Every morning she would pick up another nurse and they would drive to the hospital together to do their shift. And one morning she didn't show up. So the police uh, were called to do a welfare check of her in her home. It was discovered that her window was open and the screen was removed. When the police entered her home, there was blood everywhere. Her body was completely naked and strewn on the floor, kind of posed open. The viciousness and the sadism involved in her murder is so disturbing and so profound. There was a handprint that was found on the brass bedding, but there was no one to match the palm print to. And again, that case went cold. And the third person who was found dead in the same way as the other two was Charlotte Lamb. Charlotte Lamb, in 1978, was a legal secretary living in the Santa Monica area. She had called some friends one night to go out and go dancing in Santa Monica. Her friends decided not to go. Her body was later found in El Segundo, miles away, in an apartment complex she had no connection to. She had been um, strangled and she'd been brutally raped and murdered. Her arms had been folded behind her back, which made her back arch to expose her breasts. She'd been posed. It's just uh, very disturbing and incredibly sad. I met with Rodney five or six times. I administered assessments with regard to his sexual interests. Many times the rapist, killer, uh, antisocial person will pose dead bodies and they do want uh, law enforcement and other people to see this and there's a message in that. The message for Rodney is that I am here, you will remember me. So instead of hiding in the shadows, Rodney Alcala is almost fearless and he puts himself out there in perhaps the most public way possible. Rodney going on the dating game is a great example of him being predatory, him being confident, narcissistic, and of course he wouldn't go on unless he would win. And five, four, three. He always wins. Baxter number one is a successful photographer. If you might find him skydiving or motorcycling, please welcome Rodney Alcala. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Bachelor number one. 
Yes. What's your best time? Night times when it really gets good. In retrospect, it has got to be one of the creepiest moments on TV. He says, I always get my girl. The so-called dating game killer is one of the country's most notorious criminals. They told us that they had found Robin. It was devastating. There's nothing that hurts like that. Nothing. Her plan was to shoot Alcala. She wanted to avenge her daughter. He was a sadistic killer who deserved death. Model prisoner, they said, when he was out on the streets again. A pattern of catch and release that would continue for more than a decade. All these pictures that the police had from a serial killer. His victims are still out there. So by 1978, the body count is piling up. Rodney Alcala has murdered at least five women on two coasts and almost murdered a little girl. And he's just about to make his primetime debut. In the 70s, I was the executive producer and Ellen was the contestant coordinator. The show that Rodney Alcala appeared on aired in September 1978. The dating game appearance is just a bizarre part about this case. And I think that what it, what it reflects is the narcissism and the ego and the arrogance of a serial killer. So he actually tries out for Chuck Berry Productions and becomes a bachelor for the dating game. He was very striking. I don't know, there was a boldness about him and he had long black hair. He was just a striking looking person. In terms of putting him on as a contestant, I think on the form I wrote MW, which was my symbol for no way, no darn way, <laughs> is this guy gonna be on the show? Because I noticed that he had a very strange personality. It's like, are you kidding? He's so attractive. Everyone's going to love him. All the women are going to love him. And I said, all right, well, all right, we'll put him on a show, but we've got to surround him with two guys that have personalities and that are respectable and decent and fun. My name is Jed Mills. When I got the job on uh, the dating game, they said, you're going to be bachelor number two, so you'll be sitting in the center. Bachelor number one is a little creepy. Uh, I noticed that right away. In the green room, he jumps in he says i always get my girl number one would you say hello to cheryl please we're gonna have a great time together cheryl immediately did not like this guy and here we go bachelor number one yes what's your best time one of our edicts was to make the show much sexier and much more provocative than the show in the 60s. Everything was sexy in the 70s. Um, so we pushed the envelope. The best time is at night. At night times when it really gets good. The sexual innuendo intrigued the audience. They loved it and they started clapping. Yeah, they loved this guy. Oddly enough, 42 years later, I still remember a show of Bradshaw. She did voices. And she says, suppose I was auditioning you for a private class and you're a dirty old man. And you're a dirty old man. Take it. Come on, over here. <laughs> In retrospect, it has got to be one of the creepiest moments on TV. The audience is beside themselves. They love this. <laughs> Cheryl Bradshaw asked about what kind of food he would be if she was going to serve him for dinner. I'm called the banana, and I look really good. Uh, can you be a little more descriptive? Peel me. In retrospect, it sounds horrible, but at the time, we were looking for raunchy, sexy answers, and that was one. Taken in context now, oh my God. Rodney's motives for going on the dating game are, in my opinion, 
um, part of his personality disorder. He wants a lot of attention and he believes he should have it. He's quite bright and he wants the world to know who he is. When it became time for the bachelorette to choose number one, number two, or number three, she said, well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one, that's your number one, all right. This is your date, the Rodney Alcala. Rodney, come on, sir. She seemed very excited about seeing him. And when he came around, I would say it was a pretty um, lukewarm togetherness. She called the office the next day and spoke to Ellen. She said, Ellen, I can't, um, I can't go out with this guy. He's, there's weird vibes that are coming off of him. He's, he's very strange. I'm not comfortable. Is that going to be a problem? And of course, I said no. I would be very interested in knowing what happened in the days after when the person who chose him would not date him. Jill Parento was a 21-year-old college student and data entry worker. She lived in an apartment by herself. On June 13th, she went to a Dodger game and came home and was never heard from again. The next day, she never showed up at work. When law enforcement entered her home, she was found in her bedroom. Her body was lying next to the bed, very similar to Charlotte Lamb's, where she was laid on her back fully naked. She had a pillow up behind her back that propped her breasts up. So this is, again, another avoidable set of killings by this guy that should have stayed in prison but he didn't even break stride on the continued crimes that he kept committing. My mom's plan was to shoot Alcala. In those days, they didn't have metal detectors and they didn't use them, so she got into the courtroom. She really didn't care about anything else at that point. She wanted to avenge her daughter. In 1979, Rodney was uh, living at his mother's house where he had a separate entrance and perhaps he lived there because he didn't have to pay any rent. He had taken a lot of like nude photos and he would send these photos to New York and get paid for them. And they would go into like pornography magazines. That's what he did. Not only was Rodney on the lam for three years, 10 most wanted, 34 months in prison for tally. Two and a half years in prison for a felony of giving drugs to a minor. He's out. He's free. He's on the prowl again. On June 20th, 1979, Rodney Alcala leaves his mother's house and drives to Huntington Beach. And he starts in a place called Sunset Beach, which is a little bit north on Pacific Coast Highway. And he runs into a 17-year-old girl on roller skates named Lori Wirtz. I was with my friend Patty, and we decided to go to Sunset Beach. We were approached by Alcala. And he says, I'm a photographer, and hey, if you could just, you know, skate this way, I'll take some photos. And I said, oh, that's OK. I'll just help him out. And there's a series of these photographs that are taken by Rodney Alcala. He was a formally trained photographer which really played into his method of luring these women and young girls into vulnerable positions. It's my opinion with regard to Rodney that deviant behavior is always preceded by deviant fantasy. The taking the pictures, going around looking for little girls, sizing people up. It's a part of the constellation of the Rodney Alcala killing machine. The encounter with Lori Wirtz is very important for two different reasons. Number one, it shows that he's actually down in Huntington Beach that day, which he later denies. And it also shows that he's actively hunting for his next victim. He was asking me all kinds of questions, like where I'm from, my name, my age. He tried really hard to get me in the car. He tried to get me in the car and leave my friend on the beach. She doesn't bite, won't get in his car. 
He started to drive away and I did see that he was driving toward Huntington Beach. Huntington Beach in 1979 in June was chock full of kids and sunbathers and rollerbladers and people walking on the boardwalks and just having fun. The vibe in Huntington Beach back in the 70s was pretty easy going. You felt safe. Robin Samso was a 12-year-old, blonde, blue-eyed poster child for athleticism and healthy lifestyle. I'm Robin's oldest sister. We are two of four children, two boys and two girls. Robin was the baby of the family. Her brothers, sisters, mother all doted over Robin. She always had a spirit about her. I mean, everybody that met her fell in love with her. Rodney Alcala winds up on the beach talking to Bridget Wilbert and Robin Sampson. When Robin and I crossed 14th Street is when I believe he spotted us. And what he's doing is he's saying, hey, I'm a photographer, you're beautiful, you could be a model, how about you let me take pictures? And I was having none of it. I was like, no, no. And he reached out and put his hand on Robin's leg. And that's when I grabbed her and I said, like, no, this, this isn't good. So one of the moms comes over and is like, who are you? Why are you talking to him? And he scurries off like a cockroach. Robin had to be at a dance class at 4 o'clock, so she and Bridget went back to Bridget's house. It was time for Robin to be going because she needed to be in the ballet studio to answer phones. That was how she paid for her ballet. Robin was running late, so Bridget let her use her bike. Go get my bike, I said, and don't stop. It was very important to me to say that. He's in his car. He had maps to Southern California. He had blacked out windows. He had this rolling trap to try to get people in it. And then my house phone rang, and it was one of Robin's brothers. And he said, is Robin still with you? Has she left? because she hasn't shown up to ballet. And there's not a sign of anything, no bike, no person on the side of the road, nothing. Mom began to worry and still uh, an hour or so later when Robin still hadn't returned, she called the police to file a missing persons report. That was my mom's baby and she... My mom cried every day. Bridget was later introduced to a sketch artist to compile a composite of the individual they'd been talking to on the beach. And when I was done, I was like, that's him. That is him. It's Rodney call. I mean, you look at that and it's Rodney call. Approximately 12 days after Robin went missing, a park ranger in the Sierra Madres at a location called Chantry Flats located some human remains but she's been scavenged. And what that means is animals have eaten her. During their search of the area, they also found a shoe that was identified as belonging to Robin and a beach towel. And that's how they found this beautiful 12-year-old girl. I remember I was laying on the couch and the doorbell rang. And I answered the door and it was the police. They came in and they told us that they had found Robin. And my mom broke down, as well as everybody else, my brothers and I. It was devastating. Her mother, you know, wanted to see her, her, her daughter's body. And they had to explain to her that there, um, that there is no body. There's a skull and their bones. My mom just, she was never the same. It's like her life just had this big empty hole and everybody else was just on the outside looking in. They arrest Rodney Alcala at his mother's house in Monterey Park. After that, they obtained a search warrant for his mother's residence where he was living. They get inside Rodney Alcala's residence and they see a receipt for a self-storage facility in the city of Seattle. 
So in really good heads up police work, paperwork is not a part of the search warrant, so they cannot collect it. But it's in plain sight, so they write down the information. One of his sisters went to visit Alcala in jail, and they started talking about the storage locker. And Rodney Alcala is overheard saying, where's the effect of, well, it's good that they don't know about the storage locker. The cops actually overheard the conversation. And they get inside, and they find a treasure trove of, of evidence. I mean, it breaks the case. They arrest Rodney Alcala, they bring him to Huntington Beach, and they interview him. Can you throw around him? After the police interview him, he's very savvy, and he gives up very little information, and he essentially denies all wrongdoing. They get up to this storage locker in the city of Seattle. They find thousands of pictures of young people, older people, all kinds of people in compromised positions. They also find various forms of jewelry, a bunch of different earrings and little keepsakes. Those are trophies. For Rodney, it's his vehicle for power and control. That's why he keeps things. I remember them asking my mom to the police department to come and identify some things that they found at a locker in Washington. Two of the earrings found were gold ball earrings. Robin was described as wearing those earrings on the day that she disappeared. In 1980, Rodney Alcala was tried for the murder of Robin Samso. One of the stories that Marianne Connolly, Robin's mom, told was that during the 1980 case, she actually showed up with a gun. Her plan was to shoot Alcala. She really didn't care about anything else at that point. She wanted to avenge her daughter. In those days, they didn't have metal detectors and they didn't use them, so she got into the courtroom. I remember she was very calm. She just kept saying, everything's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be okay. The trial began, and she had her hand on her purse, and she was ready to kill the man who had murdered her daughter. I do remember her telling me that she heard Robin's voice and told her not to do it. So she had changed her mind. On May 8th, 1980, the jury on the Robin Samso case deliberated less than five hours. Rodney Alcala was convicted and sentenced to death. He was taken to San Quentin, where he was put on death row. Several years later, an appeal came up. And to everyone's shock and sorrow and horror, the case was repealed. The verdict was overturned by the California Supreme Court because the justices determined that the jurors in the trial had been improperly informed of Alcala's prior sex crimes. I think that there's been a gross miscarriage of justice for being found guilty of something that I didn't do. In 1984, we learned that Alcala was getting a new trial. Once again, my mother was completely destroyed. Just can't believe that we have to be punished for what he did and that's really what it amounts to we're the ones that are being punished it means nothing to him in the 1986 retrial of rodney alcala a new prosecutor was assigned he was very confident in his ability to be able to get a conviction on that seven years to the day of robin samso's disappearance the second jury convicted rodney alcala and also recommended that he be sentenced to die the second time he was found guilty and he got the death penalty again, and we were extremely happy. One would think that's the end. He's now going to spend the rest of his life on death row until he gets executed. Well, that wasn't the case. In 2001, 
Rodney's death penalty was again overturned. At this point, it's important to remember that Rodney Alcala has been in custody ever since being accused of murdering Robin Samso in 79. He's now 58 years old, and life behind bars has taken its toll, not only on Rodney Alcala, but also on the victim's families who've been trying to achieve justice. Twice Alcala has been convicted and sentenced to death. Twice the convictions were reversed on appeal. The main reason was an ineffective assistance of counsel claim, meaning that Rodney's attorney had not put forth a strong enough defense on his behalf. My mom really kind of lost it then. Every time this happens, it's like losing Robin all over again. I don't know if you've ever lost a child, but <laughs> there's nothing, nothing that hurts like that, nothing. Amazingly, at this point, right now, Call has escaped the death penalty two times, and now these victims and these families are going to be turning to me and my team to ensure that he's punished for this once and for all. This case was assigned to me back in 2003 when my boss came in and essentially gave me the rundown on it, said that it was going to be a tough one. That's when Matt Murphy decided to go back to the evidence. And he had that pouch of jewelry that was recovered in the Seattle storage locker reanalyzed for DNA. Which meant that Rodney's DNA could be put up against the DNA that had been taken decades earlier from the people whom we all believed he had murdered. The DNA matched Charlotte Lamb, Jill Parenteau, Georgia Wickstead, and Jill Barkham. At that point, Rodney Alcala is clearly now known as a serial killer. When you, when you get a case like this, the first thing you do is you meet with the family members. And it, it really, it drives you. And th they say you see the reflection of your victim in, you know, in the eyes of the people who love them. I forget a lot of things. Except the most important thing I can forget, and that's her and how she died. I was the same exact age as Robin Sampson. We were both 12 years old in 1979. And you connect with, her, with, with your victim. Matt Murphy was a young, talented, brilliant prosecutor, and the Alcala case would be his 107th homicide. And now we're, you know, we're going to be in one of my courts in front of one of my judges. And I was going to do everything I could to make sure that he faced justice for what he did. The third death penalty trial was set for 2010. Matt Murphy and I uh, ended up being co-counsel on the case once we brought our L.A. cases down to Orange County. So we had all these really good professionals that came together. I came to know uh, Rodney Alcala by being on the Orange County panel of expert witnesses. I met with Rodney. We met a total of 18 hours over a number of days. And this third time around, 66-year-old Rodney Alcala decides he'll represent himself. He is a narcissist. He is has a genius IQ measured by some. So he's very brilliant and thinks that that translates into being able to be uh, a good lawyer for himself in, in the case. Alcala's choice to represent himself was a message to Mr. Murphy that he is equal to him. Mr. Alcala's perceptions about his own superiority should never, ever be underestimated. She'd been gagged with a t-shirt shoved down her mouth. I wanted the jury to see the level of violence because one of the things that we needed to prove was torture, so that we needed to prove he intended to inflict pain on these victims. Alcala would strangle the women into unconsciousness, wait till they wake up, and then strangle them again. He knew exactly what he's doing, and he enjoyed what he was doing. So these are the facts of the Samson case. Because uh, Rodney Alcala was representing himself, he got to cross-examine the witnesses. And then, of course, questioned Robin Samso's mom. This is what they looked like. He was questioning my mother about the earrings. 
trying to create doubt. Alcala tried to argue with my mother. All the jury sees is the man who murdered this poor woman's daughter cross-examining her. It was so hard watching her that I think the three of us just sat there and sobbed. Robin Samso's day in court is today. You make sure that he is held responsible for what happened to that little girl. Murphy and his closing arguments, I mean, they were fantastic. He got her into his car and he drove her up to those mountains. And Rodney Alcala smashed her face in, but she was still alive. He brutalized her. He was rattled after my closing argument. Because that's when he first learned, you know, he wasn't as smart as he thought he was. The day the verdict was read, the courtroom was very still and very quiet. We, the jury, further find and affix the degree thereof murder in the first degree. The verdict was guilty on all charges across the board, all five murders. The evidence that we put in for the penalty phase of the trial focused largely on his prior sexual assaults of Tally Shapiro. When Matt reached out to me in 2010, he was pretty adamant that he really needed me to come forth and help put um, a call away. So now we've come full circle from 68 to 79. So bringing Tally Shapiro in as the one who lived, as the one who got away, is very important for a jury to see what a monster Rodney Alcala is. I was there for the Samso family. I've never been the victim. I've always been the survivor. If you decide that the death penalty is appropriate punishment, you shouldn't feel too good about it. After hearing all the evidence, the jury went back to deliberate one more time. And they came back with a verdict in a little less than two hours. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, determined that the penalty to be imposed upon defendant Rodney James Alcala to be death. I feel like Robin's life meant something, even in 12 years. She stopped him from killing anybody else. And I believe that if you would have told her that God was going to use her for this purpose, she would have been okay with it. I just pray that I live long enough to watch him be executed. I only wish that I could be the one to administrate the, the injection. In 2019, the state of California placed a moratorium on the death penalty. So that meant that all prisoners on death row, and this included Rodney Alcala, received a stay of execution. This did mean, though, that Robin Samso's mother would not see Rodney Alcala executed. July 23rd, 2019, my mom passed away. She wanted to see that day that Alcala leaves this earth, that he just does not breathe anymore. And it's unfair, it's unfair. Somebody so cruel and evil. Cold case investigators tonight saying they have solved two of New York City's most notorious murders. New York had been investigating cases involving Rodney Alcala, a murder in 1971 and a murder in 1977. Although Alcala is already on death row in California, he will be extradited here to go on trial for killing the two New York women. They decided to charge Rodney with the two New York murders. He conceded that he did kill uh, the two women in question. I was surprised that he pled guilty. I think ultimately he knew he was going to be convicted. Mr. Alcala got 25 years to life, which is the highest sentence under the law. After the trial, the Huntington Beach Police Department released hundreds of the photos that they found in that Seattle locker to the general public. Police don't know if any of the people in these pictures were victims of Alcala, but hope the public might be able to help identify them. After the Huntington Beach Police Department released those photographs, the decades-old mystery of Christine Thornton was about to come full circle. My son sent this email to me with all these pictures in it that the police had from a serial killer. That was her. 
that was definitely her. I think, you know, having Christine being gone for so long, it was difficult because, you know, we all knew that something, something bad had happened to her. For nearly 40 years, Christine Thornton's family uh, assumed she was dead. She just vanished out of their lives. In 82, this uh, herder out in the middle of nowhere comes across uh, a pile of bones, obviously human remains. Several uh, initial deputies responded along with detectives. Um, and what they found was it was a body of a 25 to 35 year old female. They also found uh, the bones of an unborn child mixed in, largely all intact. The clothing was still there. Even some jewelry were all located. They couldn't determine a cause of death. What they believed was that it was possibly a strangulation because one of the pant legs was tied in a ligature. The detectives at that time were, uh, they used the skull and sent it off to the crime lab in order to get a reconstruction of what they felt this person looked like. They determined that it was a, it was a young female and uh, brunette. They unfortunately weren't able to uh, identify her and the case went cold. In 2013, several of the detectives, including myself, were assigned specific cold cases. So this box was almost falling apart when I initially was assigned this case. There was still bone fragment and skin tissue saved at the crime lab after all those years. If you have DNA, you run it. And then you try to find out by sending it down through CODIS and missing persons to find out if you can get a match. CODIS refers to the Combined DNA Index System. It was created in 1998. DNA is entered into a national database, and this helps the authorities find missing people and also solve crimes. I was basically told it was now a waiting game. I honestly thought I'd be you know, 10, 20 years retired before I'd get a phone call saying that, that they'd identified her. So in 2013, my son sent an email to me knowing that he had an aunt that he had never met. He knew the story that she went missing and he came across this article with all these pictures in it that, that the police had from a serial killer. Her son found the website that had all the pictures that they found in Alcala's locker up in Seattle. She looked through all these photographs and kept stopping at that one photograph of a beautiful brunette seated on the back of a motorcycle. And I'm like, that's, I think that's Chris. And, and sure enough, I looked at her little pinky toe, which I remember, it, it just was very distinctive on her other toes and you know I kind of knew that that was her that was definitely her at that point is when she decided to submit her DNA sample as a reference to hopefully identify Christine detective Sheeman came to my office to tell me that they had a match and an identification just shy of two years later is when I was off duty and I decided to check my email. The email I received identified my victim from Granger as Christine Ruth Thornton. So this is the copy of the photo that was found in Rodney Alcala's possession. Trying to match this photo out in the Granger Prairie, uh, 
seems almost impossible, but we were able to match this photograph up just based off of two different ridges. You can actually hold this picture up and actually show that this is the almost the exact area that uh, this photograph potentially was taken um, back in 1977. And here we are in 2020. It was pretty shocking to find this area and to know what, what transpired here all those years ago. We spoke to uh, detectives with the Huntington Beach Police Department and put a timeline together. So in July of 1977, with the permission of his parole officer, he's allowed to travel back to New York. And Rodney O'Call wasn't flying. Rodney O'Call was driving. So Rodney O'Call leaves, leaves New York, comes back to Los Angeles. And we determined around the time that Christine was killed, he had been traveling across the nation. The motorcycle uh, was actually owned by Rodney Alcala, and they were able to, to find that motor motorcycle in his possession. There's no rhyme or reason how, how these two people, one so good and one not, cross paths and end up there. I thought we had enough evidence to possibly charge him, but before we did that, I wanted to speak with him. I've done hundreds and hundreds of interviews in my career, but I, I told myself, how the hell do you interview a serial killer? It's 2016, six years after Rodney Alcala has been convicted for the murders of Robin Samso and the other women. He's 73 years old and his health is failing. He's confined to a bed at Corcoran State Prison. And that's where Wyoming officials come to confront him for the murder of Christine Thornton. As we got in there, it was dingy colored pink peach in Alcala's medical cell. It was like something off a horror movie, paint peeling off the walls, flies buzzing around the room. It's something that I'll never forget, seeing him lying in his bed. And I just, I remember looking at him going, this, this is him. I identified myself, read him his rights, and we started pulling out photographs of the original crime scene. Now he knew why we were there. This area looks familiar. Part of my area. What do you mean by part of your area? Part of your area is that I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. It's almost like it's his killing field. We also showed Rodney Alcala the picture of Christine seated on the back of his motorcycle and gives me chills even today to remember his reaction. Talk to me about the picture. What picture? The picture that you're pointing at. It's on your mind. Talk to me. God, talk to me. Tell me about that girl. He took his finger and he started tracing her body on the photograph. And then he started tapping on the photograph and kept doing that for a couple more minutes. That's a guy who wants to relive it again. It empowers him, right? It, it, he would relive that. You could see his eyes moving in his eyelids, almost like he had relived that moment that entire moment for however long it lasted with Christine out in the desert. Do you know her? Yes or no? Yes. Do you remember taking this picture? Yes. Okay. Now the question is, Mr. Alcala, how did she end up dead? Did you kill her? Yes or no, sir? When it comes to the, the big question, he's not going to give it to you. But we got him to admit that he was there. And we got him to admit that he knew Christy. And that's all we needed. So Ron Alcala was eventually charged with first-degree murder in Sweetwater County, Wyoming. They informed me that he was not able to travel without great expense. And so I made the decision that I was not going to try to bring Alcala back to stand trial in Wyoming. 
best place for Rodney Alcala is exactly where we left him. Seeing that jail cell and that setup that he's in, he's where he needs to be. It was disappointing that we weren't going to get a conviction on our murder, but the good thing about all of this is that this man has been brought to light as being a serial killer. His victims are still out there. Over the years, Rodney Alcala was given multiple opportunities to disclose those victims, whether part of plea deals to avoid the death penalty, but he continuously refused. <laughs> Hãy subscribe 